Hey everybody, it's Tuesday, May 18th, and as you can see here in the aim today, our goal for today's video is to review the free response question that was assigned yesterday. Now, if you remember, this free response question was out of the uh, batch of questions they released on the first administration of this year's AP test. As such, we have no scoring guide. We could probably take a pretty good guess at what would be in the scoring guide, but of course, we're just going to go over the answers here maybe do a little bit of speculating about what the scoring guide will show, but that's pretty much it. So this question here says, a group of students is investigating how the thickness of a plastic rod affects the maximum force, F max, with which the rod can be pulled without breaking. Two students are discussing models to represent how F max depends on the rod thickness. Student A claims that F max is directly proportional to the radius of the rod. Student B claims that F max is directly proportional to the cross-sectional area of the rod, the area of the base of the cylinder, shaded gray in the figure above, and that would be right here. Now, hopefully, what you realized here is that the fact that they showed you specifically which part of the cylinder they were talking about made this part a little easier for you. It's important to remember that the cross-sectional area of anything is what you would see if you took that thing and cut it in half and then looked at the part that you just cut. Because this is a cylinder, the cross-sectional area of this shape is going to be a circle, or at least the area of a circle. The cross-section is a circle. The cross-sectional area is the area of a circle. If you realize that, then essentially what you really get to is the heart of the question, because student A is claiming that the maximum force is directly proportional to the radius of the rod, and since the cross-sectional area, the area of a circle, is given by the equation pi r squared, then you would know that the fact that student B is saying the maximum force is directly proportional to the cross-sectional area of the rod, it's really just another way of saying that the maximum force is directly proportional to the square of the radius. Now, of course, if you don't remember the radius, or excuse me, the area of a circle equation, it is important to point out that information is in the reference table. There is a whole geometry and trigonometry section of the reference table which you should just remember is there. Now, obviously, you could go and memorize each little bit of information uh, that's in there. I don't know that I would recommend doing that, but you should just know at least to some degree that you have your area equations for a rectangle, triangle, circle. You got volume equations for a rectangular solid, as they say, a volume of a cylinder, a surface area of a cylinder, although that's never really going to come up, and then volume and surface area equations for a sphere. And of course, you got your business about the right triangles here. Just keep that in mind. Hopefully, you recognize that. I know we talked about cross-sectional areas of wires in honors physics. Uh, that recognition here at the beginning of this question, at least, is like extremely important. And so uh, hopefully, when you were going through this problem yesterday, you recognize that. So that's the intro. Student A says that F max is directly proportional to the radius. Student B claims that F max is directly proportional to the cross-sectional area, or in other words, the radius squared. Part A of this question here says the students have a collection of many rods of the same material. The rods are all the same length, but come in a range of six different thicknesses. Design an experimental procedure to determine which student's model, if either, correctly represents how F max depends on the rod thickness. In the table below, list the quantities that would be measured in your experiment. Define a symbol to represent each quantity, and also list the equipment that would be used to measure each quantity. You do not need to fill in every row. If you need additional rows, you may add them to the space just below the table. It should be pretty clear to everybody that something we are definitely going to have to, to measure here is the breaking force, which they already told us uh, in the text of the problem was given by the uh, symbol here, F max. So I'm going to write here, breaking slash max force. This is, after all, a force. And we're going to give it the symbol F max. And the equipment that we're going to use for the measurement should be pretty clear to everybody. We're going to use a force sensor. Now, you could also use a spring scale. That's perfectly acceptable for this kind of experiment, I think. You get a little bit of a more accurate reading, in my view, if you use a force sensor. And so that's what you should say. Now, I would imagine that a lot of you probably wrote next in the chart, or first maybe if you wrote that, the radius. Now, whether or not that is acceptable, I think depends on exactly what the scoring guide says. And again, we don't have access to that. But it's important to realize 
it really is a nightmare to try to measure the radius of something like this because you have to find the exact midpoint. Now, you could argue that the hook is, is exactly at the center if it is, uh, and that will give you the center point of the object. Of course, you'd be missing out uh, on the space that's taken up by that hook. And so what I'm going to say here, which I think is a good thing to remember, we actually did talk about this when we talked about the circle lab at the very beginning of the year. Uh, a good quantity to measure here would be the diameter. Measuring the diameter directly sort of gets around a lot of the complications about the radius that you have to pinpoint the exact center of the circle and make sure you're holding things straight. If you measure the diameter, then all you have to do is cut that in half uh, to determine the radius. And of course, we can measure the diameter with a ruler, and I guess I'll just write here, ruler slash meter stick. It's important to realize this hook gives you some complicating factors for measuring the diameter and the radius. But we could use a vernier caliper, which we actually used in that circle, as I was mentioning to you, to measure like the diameter of, of a rod uh, in a very easy way. And so I'm actually going to write here ruler slash meter stick slash vernier caliper. This is an important thing to remember. Now, is this exact kind of thing going to come up on the AP test since it comes up in this experimental design question? I'm going to go ahead and guess probably not. But regardless, it still is a good thing to remember that the diameter of objects can be measured using a vernier caliper because you basically just wrap the jaws of the caliper uh, around the outside of the object. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down, adding any parts of this that may be missing from your own work. And when you hit play, we'll move on to the next part. All right, moving on to the next part here. This next part says, describe the overall procedure to be used, referring to the table. Provide enough detail so that another student could replicate the experiment, including any steps necessary to reduce experimental uncertainty. As needed, use the symbols defined in the table and or include a simple diagram of the setup. Now, I did not include a simple diagram of the setup. I don't really think it's required for a question like this. Obviously, if you want to, you can. That's entirely up to you. Uh, but here's what I wrote. I wrote here, first, we can measure the radius of each rod by measuring its diameter and then dividing by two. To determine the diameter of each rod, we can use a vernier caliper to measure the outside diameter of the rod and then divide it by two. We could also use a ruler to measure the diameter of the rod. To use a ruler to measure the rod's diameter, we can slide the ruler up and down until we find the largest or widest part of the rod to make sure we're not just measuring the length of some cord. I think that's an important thing to point out also. Obviously, if there's a hook in the exact center of this thing, then that does make a little bit of a difference. But it's important to realize if you are measuring the diameter of any circular object, the way you could do that is basically just by holding the ruler like this and sliding it up and down and watching what happens to the measurement. As you continue to move down from like exactly this point, the measurement's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and then eventually it's going to start getting smaller again. The point where it goes from getting bigger to getting smaller again is your midpoint, and so that's going to be where your diameter measurement is. If you are measuring the length anywhere else, you are just measuring the length of a cord, which notice here, I'll try to draw as best as I can, uh, is going to be slightly smaller than the di actual diameter of the thing. That said, I think a vernier caliper here is absolutely the way to go. Uh, you just wrap it around the outside. So basically, you have your circle like this. Uh, the jaws of the caliper kind of come like this. They have that sliding scale uh, with the marks on it for you to make your measurement. And that's pretty much it. Of course, there are digital calipers as well. And so if you just wrap it around it, it'll literally just display the number on the screen. And that's that. Moving on, I said we can then take half of this number to determine the radius. Obviously, if you use the ruler as well. And I wrote here then, to measure the force applied to the rod, we could hook one end of the rod around a heavy ring stand. Remember, a ring stand is just that device with like a base uh, and then just like a pretty much just a cylindrical piece that goes up that you could attach stuff to. We could just basically hook it uh, around there and then pull. And I wrote here, we can uh, hook the one end of the rod around a heavy ring stand and use a force sensor to pull on the rod. We can gradually increase the force applied to the end of the rod until it breaks. And of course, we can repeat this procedure for each thickness of rod three times and average them together to determine the average breaking force and repeat that procedure for all six rod 
thicknesses. Now, exactly what the scoring guide is looking for, I'm going to put that back on the screen, but exactly what the scoring guide is looking for as far as include any steps to reduce experimental uncertainty, it depends on exactly how you interpret the beginning of the problem. Because it says, the students have a collection of many rods of the same material. The rods are all uh, the same length, but come in a range of six different thicknesses. I, I think it could be argued that that description shows that there's multiple rods of each thickness. Of course, the real problem you have here is once you do the experiment with a particular rod once, the rod's now broken because you're trying to measure the breaking force. Uh, but the basic idea behind this problem is that a student claims that the breaking force is directly proportional to the radius. The other student essentially claims it's proportional to the radius squared. So you measure the radius, and then you measure the breaking force. We're going to be able to see from that information if the breaking force is proportional to the radius or the radius squared, or neither, really, also. It's important to realize that's a possibility, too. Uh, take a second to pause this video here, write that down, adding any parts of this that may be missing from your own explanation. And when you hit play, we'll move on. Now, just before we move on here, I think it's important to realize uh, there's going to be one point here, I think especially because they said, including any steps necessary to reduce experimental uncertainty, there's going to be a point for that. These things are usually four points. Uh, so I'm going to assume there may be some point for like a reasonable procedure that would allow you to, you know, to confirm or refute the kids' hypotheses or the kids' models. Uh, one point for talking about measuring the diameter or the radius, and then one point for talking about how to measure the force. That's pretty much it. I could see them maybe giving a point for uh, talking about not just measuring force in general, but the force required to break the object. Um, but that's anybody's guess, I suppose. We will be able to see this in July once the scores are released. They usually release the scoring guide after they release the scores, but that would be. Uh, my guess. All right, moving on to the next part here. The next part was the graphing part. I actually really like this part. It says for a rod of radius R naught, it is determined that F max is F naught, as indicated by the dot on the grid below. On the grid, draw and label graphs corresponding to the two students' models of the dependence of F max on rod uh, radius. Clearly label each graph A or B corresponding to the appropriate model. Now let's just jump back to their descriptions. Student A says F max is directly proportional to the radius. In an indirect way, student B says it's proportional to the radius squared. So let's just show that over here on the side. A says F max is directly proportional to R, and B says F max, in other words, is directly proportional to R squared. And so doing this for A then is going to be real, real easy. If the radius is zero, the breaking force is going to be zero. That almost doesn't really even make sense, but we could just put a, a point there at the origin. Uh, if the rod has no radius, it effectively doesn't exist, and therefore there would be no breaking force. Starting with A, this is really simple because this student says F max is directly proportional to R. And so what that means is when the radius doubles, the force doubles. And so two R naught, is going to have a breaking force of 2 f naught. Of course, 3 r naught is going to have 3 f naught. 4 r naught is going to correspond to 4 f naught. And 5 r naught with 5 f naught. Notice here that that's what it means for these things to be directly proportional. And so I'm going to write here when r prime equals 2 r, f prime, or I guess I'll write f max prime, equals 2 f naught, and so on. I guess I'll just write also, just to make it totally clear, when r prime equals 4 r, f max prime equals 4 f naught. And so I'm going to try my best here uh, to draw a line through this that's straight. Um, it's a digital pen. It gets kind of hard to do this. I'm going to assume that that's going to be close enough here. Of course, you realize you want to make this line go through all of the points. Uh, as best you can. Of course, if you have a ruler when you're doing this on the actual test, it should be a little more straightforward. Obviously, this is now uh, terrible, but that's the idea. It should be just a straight line that goes through these data points. And I guess I'll just, now that I've totally obscured my data points, I'll just go back in red 
and, and color them in again. I'll make the other ones a different color, I guess. And so there uh, is your line for student A's model. The force is directly proportional to the radius. Now, student B says something entirely different. Student B says F max is proportional to R squared. So that means when R doubles, so R prime is equal to 2R, F max prime is going to be equal to 4 F naught and so on. It's always going to go with the square. When R triples, so when R prime is equal to 3R, that means F max prime is going to be equal to 9 F naught and so on. And so here, it's important to realize that we can only put in so many of these data points and then that's it. So I guess I'll make my points in blue for this line here. Uh, I'll say that when R prime is 1R, of course, the F naught is going to be the same, right? One squared is one. So I'll just put that there. Uh, when it's 2 R naught, we're going to have a uh, 4 F naught force. When it's 3 R naught, it's going to be 9. And that's all we can fit on the graph. Here, it's going to be 16 F max. And then, of course, here it's going to be 25 F max. And that's the basic idea. And so to just try to draw this one here quickly, we'll just show, draw a curved line that goes through the points, and we'll leave it at that. Of course, this is going to continue on to 4 and 16, so somewhere up here. But with the space that's given, that's the best we could do. And the last thing we need to do here, as it says here, is clearly label each graph A or B. We'll just go ahead and label those. This one is B. That student said F max is directly proportional to R squared. This one is A. And that's it. Take a second to pause this video here. Write that down, adding any parts of this graph that may be missing from your own. And when you hit play, we'll move on. All right, moving on here, we can go on to the next part, but just very quickly, I'm going to go ahead and assume that they're going to give one point for the label. Maybe they'll give one point for just this line being straight and passing through these points, one point for this line being curved, passing through those points. There's really not a whole else that, lot else that they could possibly do here. Maybe they would say uh, you get one point for actually drawing the lines of best fit. You should be doing that on a graph like this. Uh, but for this question, that's kind of really all that can be said. All right, so the next part, part C, says the table below shows results of measurements taken by another group of students for rods of different thicknesses. And it says on the grid below, plot the data points from the table. Clearly scale and label all axes, including units. Draw a straight line or a curve that best represents the data. So there are a couple of things you need to pay attention to here. First, they are asking you explicitly to plot all the data points. They are asking you to clearly scale and label the axes, including units, and then to draw a straight line or a curve. So we, as far as like predicting what they're going to put into the scoring guide here, I'd say that's a pretty good start, right? They're probably going to include things like that in the scoring guide. So we'll go ahead and we'll put the force here on the y-axis, and we'll label that. Uh, I'll write F max here, I guess, also, force F max. Uh, labeled in newtons and we're going to put here on the x-axis our radius measured in millimeters of course i think this is the uh setup or arrangement that makes the most sense here for this particular uh set of data because ultimately it is the breaking force that depends on the radius and not the other way around and so we're going to want to put that on the y-axis now it should also be noted here i think that since we have a set of radii here that go from 0.5 to 2.5, the first thing that you should be doing is saying like, okay, well, maybe we could just do this from zero to three. And if we did that here, we would have uh, zero and then maybe we could do one, two, three, but that's not going to use half the space. We could go half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, and notice that works pretty perfectly. So I think that's the way to go based on the number of uh, things you have here. And so we'll say here that that's zero. We'll call this 0 0.5 millimeters. Notice since we have our, our measurement down here with the unit, we don't need to write the unit every single time. So we have 0, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5. I guess I'll write 1.0, uh, 2.0, 2.5, and 3.0. And that's going to be it for the radius scale. Now for the 
Uh, F max or max force part, we've got a little bit of a challenge. The F max goes from 40 to 900. And notice here, there are one, two, three, four, five markings. I think it probably just makes the most sense here to go zero to a thousand and to just go ahead and label this uh, in increments of 200. So zero, 200, 400, 600, 800, 1,000. Remember, the key detail here is just to make sure you keep these scalings equally spaced, you clearly label your values, and that's really all that needs to be said. You could go through and label all of the individual measurements here, but you don't have to. What you should realize, though, is that each of these corresponds to, you know, there's one, two, three, four, and then five up to 200. And so each of these is going to correspond to 40, right? So we have 40, then we have 80, then 120, then 160, then 200, right? This still works. So we have 240, then we'll have 280, then we'll have 320, then we'll have 360, then we'll have 400. So each of these is going to be 40. You know what? Just so we remember that, it might be a smart idea here then to just go in and fill that out here. We'll have 40, 80, at least just for the first one. Just, and really, again, you don't have to do this. But I think sometimes in the heat of these questions, when you're trying to go quick, that's like an easy thing to just screw up because you're forgetting what each of these things corresponds to. And so just labeling that might be a smart idea just so at least you can get the first one down. Notice here, by setting up the graph this way, we've kind of also sneakily confirmed that that's exactly what they wanted us to do. Notice here, that first one is 40. We have a perfect line on the graph for that. 120, we have a perfect line on the graph for that. And so we're pretty much ready to go now. Here, we're gonna have uh, our F max of 40 corresponding to our rod radius of a half. So we have a half and 40, that's gonna be a point right here. You know what? I'm actually just gonna go ahead and change the ink color to red. So there's no blending in. We'll be able to see that perfectly clearly if it's in red. Now we go to our radius of one. Then we have to go up to 120. And so that's going to be here at this line. Notice you can always like just sort of go over. Is that 120? Yeah, okay, that's good. Now we have one and a half. And so we're going to go to 320. Now just be careful. These go by 40s. So we go 240, 280. Then 320 is going to be right there. Is that right? Now you want to confirm in your head, well, if that's 320, then that's going to be 360, and then another 40 is 400. Okay, perfect. We're good. And so we color in that point, and that's it. Now we go to our uh, radius of 2, and that's going to be 520, another annoying one. So we'll have to go here, 40, and or sorry, that's 400. So we go to 2 meters. We go to 400. That's going to be 440, 480, 520. Of course, we can just confirm that that's right. If that's 520, another 40 is going to give us 560, and then up to 600. Perfect. We're golden. And then we're going to go to 2.5 here, and we're going to go to 900. So we'll come up here. This is 800. And then we'll say that this is going to be 840, 880. And then, of course, notice this one is going to go to 920. And so we're just going to kind of make a big dot here to sort of get it right in there at 900. Now you want to sort of make that large enough so that they say, eh, close enough. And close enough, of course, for these kind of things is good enough. And notice that's it. Now, I was going to mention this at the very beginning of going through this, but I decided not to. Having said that, we could go back now and say, you should have known from the jump that this was what the graph was going to look like, right? Because notice here, when we go from 0 0.5 to 1, a doubling of the rod radius, the F max does not double. It increases by more than double, right? If we go from 1 to 2, notice if they were directly proportional, this thing was going to double and it doesn't double. And so you should have known here that this graph was going to be curved. And so we'll put another point at our origin here. And now this part is going to be a mess. You'll have to bear with me. I'm actually going to hit escape just so it saves that ink so I don't mess this up here. And if I mess it up, then I can just erase it. And we're just going to try our best to just connect the points. We'll go slow here and just sort of do piece by piece. And we'll just go like that and just get this to be like a nice smooth curve as best you can, making sure the line isn't going to be straight. And of course, we can sort of fudge our mistakes here at the end by coloring in. I think that's a decent curve. I think anybody looking at that could tell that you did not intend that to be straight. And then we'll just sort of color it in here to make it look a little less horrible. And that's pretty much it. We see a nice curve on this graph for the force 
versus the radius. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down, adding any parts of this graph that may be missing from your own graph. And when you hit play, we'll move on. All right, now there hasn't quite been a question like this on the AP Physics 1 exam that was exactly like this where they gave you the data. Those of you who are in uh, Saturday tutoring this past Saturday uh, saw that we looked at a question where they asked you to sort of make a graph to measure an actual quantity rather than just like literally taking data they gave you and putting it on a graph. However, on AP Classroom, they have a question like this from AP Physics B. Basically, they took this thing, they spun it. You see that the inertia of the balls makes them want to go outwards, stretching the spring more. Uh, and so, like, the basic idea here, I think, is pretty uh, straightforward. Um, they asked you in Part B to plot the spring force as a function of the acceleration, label the axis, including the scale. I think this will give us a pretty good sense of what the scoring guide said. Notice that was Part B. If you go to the scoring guide for Part B... They gave one point for properly labeling both axes with variables and units, one point for using, a, uh, using and labeling a proper scale on both axes to use approximately half the grid. Those of you who looked at that resistivity experiment with me on Saturday tutoring saw that half the grid came up there too. You got one point earned for correctly plotting the data point, and then one point, uh, well, here it was for drawing a straight line that best represents the data. And obviously in this example, it was a curve line that best represents the data. But that's the point here. That's probably what they're going to give you the points for, for an experiment like this. All right, and moving on to the last part, part D. It says here in part D, which student's model is more closely represented by the evidence shown in the graph you drew in part C? Now, we already talked about this a little bit, but it says here student A's model shows F max is directly proportional to the radius of the rod. Student B's model shows F max is directly proportional to the cross-sectional area of the rod. It should be pretty obvious taking one look at this graph. Now, as I mentioned here, you should have been able to tell immediately when you looked at the data table. The doubling of the radius does not cause a doubling of the force. They're not directly proportional. Here, clearly, the graph is curved. That would suggest to us that the data more closely fits student B's model. Because if it was student A's model, the graph would be straight. So for the explain your reasoning part here, this is what I wrote. The student's model that, that is more closely represented by the graph we drew in part C is student B's model. Student B stated that the breaking force was directly proportional to the cross-sectional area of the rod. Since the rod is cylindrical, the cross-sectional area of the rod is essentially the area of a circle, which is given by the equation pi r squared. This means that the breaking force is really directly proportional to the square of the radius of the rod. We can see that in the nonlinearity of the graph. The data table and graph clearly show that when we double the radius, we don't see the force double, which tells us that the force is not directly proportional to the radius. Since a doubling of the radius results in an increase in the breaking force by a factor greater than two, we can tell that the force is directly proportional to the square of the radius or close enough, which means that student B's model is correct. Now, I don't want you to write that down yet because we actually need to fix that up a little bit. Notice here, when we take the radius from 0.5 to 1 and we double it, what we actually see here is our force triple. It increases by a factor of 3. When we double it again from uh, 1 meter to 2 meters, our force goes from 120 to 520, which is an increase by a factor of like 4.33-ish or whatever. And so we can say here that it's almost directly proportional to R squared, but not quite. And so the way that we should fix up this last part of that answer here is to just say, since a doubling of the radius results in an increase of the breaking force by a factor greater than two, I'm going to write here, we could tell that the force is not directly proportional to the radius, which more closely aligns with student B's model. Obviously, more data for uh, larger rod thicknesses would give us a better sense of exactly what the trend looks like, but we can tell here now they're definitely not proportional. It more closely aligns with student B's model. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, We'll wrap it up. 
All right, now obviously without the scoring guide, it's impossible to tell what they would have awarded the points for, but here's my guess. They asked you which model is more closely represented. That means you should be talking about why student A's model is not represented by the data and why student B's model is. That, to me, is the key to the answer here. Additionally, I think you definitely also want to just talk about the trends. If it was student A's model, we'd see a linear graph. We don't see a linear graph. That's how we know student A's model is not correct, and so on. Talking about the differences in the models, showing what they would show on the graph, and then talking about what the graph actually does show, I think is going to be the key to full credit here. Obviously, talking about the evidence from Part C, which is the graph you drew, is going to be a big part of it because they explicitly mention that in the question. I like this question. I think what the College Board was going for here, and I very well could be wrong about this, but I think what the College Board was going for here is they know that not everybody was in class for the entire year. And that your ability to do the normal experiments that we would see in AP physics every year was compromised. And so they chose, it seems to me, to go with an experiment that was really more about experimental design skills and not actually knowledge of physics. And that's an important thing for you to realize. And so hopefully, by doing this example, you might get a sense of where they're going to go when they give the next version of the exam on May 24th. All right, everybody. That's it for today. Have a good one.